welcome to the forum. My name is Jennifer Tice. I am a student here at the Kennedy School and the co-chair of the lead sponsor for this event, the Ecology and Environment Professional Interest Council. I'd like to start by thanking our co-sponsors, which include a long list of environmental groups on campus. Um, so here we go. Thank you to the Harvard University Committee on the Environment, the Environmental Network, Greening the Crimson, Harvard Business School, Sustainable Development Society, Harvard Graduate School of Design, Ecology and Design, Harvard Divinity School Students for Environmental Justice, the Graduate Environment and Ecology Network, Harvard Students United for Action on Climate Change, and the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee. <laughs> and Finally, I'd like to specially recognize my co-chair, Stuart Rosenberg, for all his work in making this event possible. He's over there. <laughs> it's exciting to see such a large turnout for this event. Thank you all for coming. Um, we invited Bill McDonough here to speak because of his expertise on green building to educate us in the Harvard community and the greater Boston area about this issue that's going to be facing us or the new buildings that are coming in at Harvard, at the Kennedy School, and nationwide. Uh, so, uh, the next thing I'll do is introduce Professor John Holdren, who's going to then introduce our featured speaker, Bill McDonough. John Holdren is the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy and the Director of the Science and Technology Public Policy Program here at the Kennedy School. Without further ado, here's John. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, thank you all for coming. Before I go any further, I want to uh, recognize Senator David Pryor, the director of the Institute of Politics, who's with us. And I want to recognize the executive dean of the Kennedy School, Bonnie Newman, who is here tonight. Uh, and I want to say that Joe Nye, our dean, would be here, but he's stuck in Washington, DC, uh, as usual. It is uh, a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce Bill McDonough tonight. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce somebody in the forum I actually know. Uh, I do have some qualifications which are not apparent in my bio for introducing a distinguished architect. My son, as it turns out, is an architect, practices in Monterey, California, and is a great admirer of Bill McDonough's work. Uh, as a result of my son, I know a good deal more about architecture than a physicist otherwise would. Uh, I also served with Bill McDonough on the uh, Environment Prize jury for the Heinz Foundation, uh, which was a great pleasure over a period of years, uh, among many other extraordinary buildings that Bill McDonough has done. He did the headquarters for the Heinz Family Foundations in Pittsburgh, which is a really spectacular space, I can say, as one who spent some time uh, working in that space. And my uh, other personal connection to Bill McDonough, before I tell you a little more about his more formal uh, and very extraordinary qualifications, is that uh, he is the architect for a new building that the Woods Hole Research Center is putting up in Woods Hole down in the Cape. I happen to serve as the vice chair of the board of the Woods Hole Research Center, and so I've been working closely with, with Bill in that capacity, which has been a pleasure. He is an internationally renowned uh, architect, designer, planner, and more than that, more than being a designer of green buildings, a designer of sustainable buildings, he is really an architect of a sustainable future. He was named uh, by Time Magazine in 1999 their hero for the planet. Time Magazine said in the article they wrote about them that his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that in demonstrable and practical ways is changing the design of the world. His ideas and efforts were also honored in 1996 when he got the first and only presidential award for sustainable development presented by President Clinton in a White House ceremony. He is both the founding principal of William McDonough and Partners Architects and Planners, which uh, is and has been engaged in spectacular building commissions all around the world. But he is also the co-founder and principal with German chemist Michael Braungart 
of McDonough Browngart Design Chemistry, which is a product and systems development firm that's assisting prominent client companies, which altogether have annual revenues exceeding a trillion dollars, in figuring out how to do well by doing good, how to practice business uh, in sustainable ways. He has uh, his firm have uh, designed award-winning buildings for Gap, for Nike, for Oberlin College, and others. He's in the process of uh, designing a new corporate headquarters for the Ford Motor Company. Absolutely extraordinary record, extraordinary uh, buildings, extraordinary individual. I know you're going to be entertained and informed by what he has to say tonight. Bill McDonough. Hi, everybody. I see a lot of faces, I know. Thanks for coming. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go quickly. So get ready. Here we go. I'm used to 50 minutes, as you know, as a teacher. Tonight we have 40. Um, I'm a designer, and I come to you as a designer. And there's that old joke that when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So for me, everything looks like a design problem. And, um, and in our work right now, we're asking two fundamental questions. And they are, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? Not just our children, but all the children of all species. And secondly, when do we become native to this place? When do we all become indigenous people? How many people in this room consider themselves indigenous people? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, at the Hanford nuclear plant, they had a session of scientists working on the question that I would characterize as the semiology of extreme danger. How do you design a mark on the ground where you've put the plutonium such that an extraterrestrial 5,000 years from now would not dare to dig? What an incredible design problem. And while they were going through this, the native peoples, the Yakima, were there for another meeting. And they bumped into each other during the breakout sessions. And the Yakima heard what the scientists were doing. And they started to laugh. And they said to the scientists, you know, you really don't need to do this. We'll tell them where it is. <laughs> they weren't leaving. When do we declare ourselves native to this place? And I think that question is truly fundamental for our time. And it's a strategic question, because if we look out into the world and see the tragedies that the first Industrial Revolution has wrought from a design perspective, and ask ourselves, if design is the first signal of human intention, did we intend to do the things that we see there? Do we intend for the tragedies that we see being promulgated to be promulgated? And once you all become designers, you realize that, that designers must take responsibility because if design is a signal of intention, we have to ask ourselves, did we intend to cause global warming? Did we intend to toxify the soil, give our children brain death, and so on? And what we realize is that we, as strategic creatures, that if we have these tragedies, we have to take responsibility for them. And we can't say, oh, that tragedy, global warming, that's not part of my plan. Well, it is because it's part of your de facto plan. It's the thing that's happening because you have no plan. And so the idea that we've become strategically tragic is an interesting one. One of the reasons we work in commerce so much is that in commerce, when a, a head of a company realizes that they're strategically tragic, they realize it's time to adopt a strategy of change at high speed. And strategies of change are what we're here to talk about. And there's great humility in this, because we don't know what to do. We're exploring. We're experimenting. And if anybody has any trouble in this room understanding the concept of design humility, reflect on this. It took 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. How intelligent are humans? <laughs> so these strategies of change, I think, will lead us to strategies of hope. Now, if we look at one of our great strategists, Thomas Jefferson, and I come uh, recently from the University of Virginia, where I was dean for five years, I lived in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. And when you live in a house designed by Jefferson, you recognize him not only as a great strategist, but as a great designer. Uh, he clearly saw himself as a designer first. He had a few other things on his mind. Um, <laughs> But if you go to the hilltop where this little solar house of his, Monticello, by the way, a passive solar house of astonishing uh, capacity, 
um, and intellect. And then you look at his tombstone, which he designed. You notice that on his tombstone, he only recorded those things he designed. It says Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, author of the Statute of Religious Freedom, State of Virginia, which became the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia. Now, you'll notice he's only recording his legacies, not his activities. There's absolutely no mention of having been president of the United States. And so we realize that in today's world, we record our GDP measurements as our level of activity, not legacy. When the Exxon Valdez goes down, the GDP measurements of Alaska go up because we're trying to clean up. Every case of leukemia creates 11 jobs. So here's for leukemia. And so we have to ask ourselves strategically if we could think like Jefferson as a designer and look at these three things he recorded, his designs, and ask what are the retroactive design assignments of Thomas Jefferson? What is the retroactive design assignment of the Declaration of Independence? Could you craft a document that calls for life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, free from remote tyranny? In his case, imagine this. Jefferson, Monroe, Madison, Washington, all within 60 miles of each other, they woke up every morning planning revolution. They were planning sedition. Can you imagine that that's your life state? Every morning you get up, oh, I have to work on that declaration. Can you imagine that? That's your design problem. These were revolutionaries. Now, what point do you become a revolutionary? I'd like to look at that. But let's take a look at his three designs. If we look at the Declaration of Independence, this idea of remote tyranny is fundamental. I think if he were to come back today, Jefferson would be asking for declarations, plural, of interdependence. And the design would be the same, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, but free this time from intergenerational remote tyranny. One generation tyrannizing another. This is the concept of the seven generations. And when you look at Jefferson and Franklin, who we know now spoke Mohawk, we realize they looked at the Iroquois Confederacy for its structure, but they must have looked at this instruction of the great peacemaker to make all decisions on behalf of your seventh generation. People forget the rest of it, even if it requires you to have skin as thick as the bark of a pine. Don't eat your seed corn. And we know Jefferson understood this concept for two, two reasons. One is, we are Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation, and we're still talking about his designs. And secondly, we can look at this letter that he wrote to James Madison when he was determining what the term of a federal bond should be, and he decided it should be one generation, and his logic was this. He said, the earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those that may be paid during his own lifetime, because if he could, then the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. The world would belong to the dead. Intergenerational, remote tyranny. If we look at the Bill of Rights, his second design, we realize that there's a problem now and that if Jefferson were to return today, he'd probably be calling for a Bill of Responsibilities. Because if we look at this concept of rights, we realize as I walk out to companies and say there are 16 known carcinogens in your product, and they say, it is not against the law. That's the best we can do? It's not against the law? And so we develop libraries full of our right to be stupid or dangerous and so on. And at this point in our history, perhaps it's our, our chance to be responsible for not being this way. If we look at Jane Jacobs in her book, Systems of Survival, she points out that humans have evolved two fundamental syndromes of activity for survival, what she calls the guardian and what she calls commerce. Guardian is the university, it's the state, and so on. Commerce is business. Now, when you look at the guardian, it has fundamental characteristics. It, it is slow, it's very serious, it looks after the public wheel, and it reserves the right to kill. We'll send rockets to Afghanistan armies to the Gulf. It reserves the right to be duplicitous. The CIA is legal. And it shuns commerce. This is why everybody's wondering what they're talking about in the Lincoln bedroom over coffee. If you'd come to me as the dean at the University of Virginia and said, I'd like to put my kid in your school, I'll give you a million dollars, I would say, I can't have this conversation. I shun commerce. Commerce, on the other hand, is quick, it's inventive, very creative, and it's honest. Because you can't do business with somebody for very long if you're not honest. And we realize that these two syndromes are fundamentally opposed. And, and what you recognize, as she did, you put them together, you get monstrous hybrids. If you put commerce into the guardian, you corrupt it. And if you put the guardian into commerce, you slow it down. From my perspective as a designer, a regulation is a signal of design failure. Because it's the guardian stepping into commerce and saying, wait a minute, we never gave you the right to kill. 
If you want to pollute a river and ch destroy children's brains over time downstream, we'll tell you at what rate you can dispense death. What do you call someone who's subverting a regulation and not being punished? What do we say they're doing? Our language betrays this fact. We say they are getting away with murder, indeed. A regulation is a signal of design failure. So we work with our clients to eliminate regulations, not because they want to get away with not being regulated because they want to pollute and kill, but because they don't need to be anymore because they've stopped trying to. If we look at Jefferson's third design, University of Virginia, it's still there. Uh, he got complaints from his um, state legislature that he had too many of his professors, these 10 professors who he installed on the lawn where I lived, um, were always arguing with each other. And they didn't understand that. And Jefferson's response was, of course they're always arguing with each other. Education requires the fierce clash of ideas. And in revolutionary times, indeed, we must have the fierce clash of ideas. Well, let's take some of the ideas that form a platform for the work and that designers can now use to rekindle um, a revolutionary spirit in design that one is founded on ethical principle. If we look at this idea of natural rights that came out of the Enlightenment and Hobbes and Rousseau and Locke and so on, and that Jefferson's time, this idea of no man made by natural right and so on, we then understand that, that at this point in our history, seven generations later, we can start to talk about another aspect of this, which is the rights of nature that now we're talking about endangered ecosystems. Because if we look at the history of rights, we can go back, as he did, to Anglo-Saxon precedent and see Magna Carta, the rights of noble males, his declaration, the rights of white land-owning Protestant males of a certain age, 6% of the population, uh, emancipation, suffrage, welcome aboard ladies, 1922, Native Americans, 1923, the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s. And then in 1973, the first time human beings gave something other than a human the right to even exist with the Endangered Species Act. And today, we're discussing endangered ecosystems. So what we're recognizing is now it's time to talk about the rights of nature itself. And the question I would like to ask is, as a designer, is not, as Le Corbusier said, a house is a machine for living in. Does that mean a church is a machine for praying in? A school building is a building for a, a machine for studying. Ultimately, the question then has to go beyond that to the idea of living machines. But if we look at what we see out in the world today as living machines, where we're starting to use plants to serve as human desire, we're sequestering our mercury with mustard, then are we just substituting an olive branch for a steel blade or a harsh chemical? We're using nature as a tool for anthropocentric purpose. Ultimately, I think the question has to be when do humans become tools of nature? What is nature? Emerson here on this campus in 1838 gave an essay entitled Nature. And the question in the essay was, if humans are natural, are therefore all things made by humans part of nature? And his conclusion was that nature is all those things that are immutable, what he called the unchangeable essences, the things that were too big for humans to affect. His examples were the oceans, the mountains, and the leaves. And what we realize is that at this age, we now understand we can't affect the oceans, we can't affect the mountains, we can't affect the leaves. And despite all the discussions about humans should have stewardship over the Earth's resources and so on, two fundamental things come forward. One is this native question. Orrin Lyons, the chief of the Onondaga, comes to my class to open it, and the first thing he says to the people in the room is, what you people call your natural resources, my people call our relatives. And the question is not, do we have dominion over the planetary surface, or should we become good stewards? Because in fact, we do have a form of dominion. When they pulled Scotchgard out, you know, all of a sudden we have stain-free you know, uh, stain whales. And we realize that there are hundreds of endemic human chemicals in the world that are persistent and have to be stopped. And we realize that this idea that nature is out there and it's big enough for us not to affect, it's, it's out there, but we can affect it incredibly. And we do have a form of dominion. But stewardship is implicit in this form of dominion, because how could you have stewardship over something you've killed? So the real question isn't even stewardship, it's kinship. When do we find ourselves as part of nature? Well, what is design? Design can be looked at again. Emerson in 1831 left this place to go to Europe after his wife died, and he went over on a sailboat and returned in a steamship. If we abstract this for effect, he went over in a, a solar-powered recyclable vehicle operated by craftspeople practicing ancient arts in the open air returned in a steel rust bucket, putting smoke in the sky, oil on the water, operated by people working in the darkness, shoveling fossil fuels in the mouths of boilers. <laughs> now, from a design perspective, we're still designing steamships. We're in one right now. 
If the sun was shining out there, we wouldn't even know it. We would be in here producing nuclear isotopes and global warming while we sat in the dark and talked about nuclear isotopes and global warming. Our buildings are still steamships. And so the question has to be, what would the next boat look like? What would we call the boat for Thoreau? Now that's interesting because like politics, as one of your famous politicians pointed out, all politics is local. Well indeed, all sustainability is local. When Thoreau was asked why he didn't travel very much, which would be the irony of his boat, he responded, I have traveled widely and conquered. Who's going to lead this? As Peter Senge at MIT points out, the leaders on a ship going across the ocean are the designers of the ship because you could be the best captain in the world, but if the ship isn't seaworthy, you're going down. So it's time for new direction. Let me give you a quick background on, on me. I was born in 1951 in Tokyo, Japan. I grew up in Hong Kong. And as a small child, I would be taken by my mother uh, to the money changers where she would change my dad's paycheck. And I would be standing at eye level with an 80-year-old woman who was begging using a dying baby for sympathy. Sometimes the babies were dead. I thought this was ordinary life. This is what happens when you have 6 million people on 40 square miles with no water. We had people die of cholera on our doorstep. During the dry seasons, we had four hours of water every fourth day. I spent my summers in the Olympic Peninsula, the Puget Sound. My grandfather had been a lumberjack there, cutting the old growth forest, and he had won the Yukon Lottery, and he built a log cabin with my grandmother. And they raised oysters and traded raspberries for flowers with their neighbors, saved rubber bands and aluminum foil, and composted and things like that. And I thought that was ordinary life in this world of incredible abundance. In the early 60s, my father became the president of Seagram. We moved to New York, their international company, Wines and Spirits. We moved there, and I lived in Westport, Connecticut for high school, where 16-year-olds uh, had Porsches. I thought that was ordinary life. I had to drive a hardware truck because my dad was a depression child, but <laughs> he said it was good for me, and I suppose it was. But then I went to Dartmouth and then Yale for graduate school. And while I was at Yale, I built the first solar heated house in Ireland, which will give you a sense of my ambition. <clears throat> and then in uh, 1984, I was engaged by Environmental Defense Fund after I would started my office in New York um, to design their national headquarters. And at the end of our contract negotiations, Fred Krupp, their executive director, said, by the way, if anybody in our office gets sick from indoor air quality, we're going to sue you. So we talked to our attorneys and said, what does this mean? And they said, oh, this means negligence. I said, what is negligence? They said, well, negligence is when you know better and you do it anyway. And I said, well, this is no problem. We don't know anything. Neither does anybody else. <laughs> How can we be negligent? We'll just do the best we can. So we got into it. And we started calling the manufacturers. And we said, what's in your products? And they said, it's proprietary. It's legal. Go away. And what we recognized is that when we assembled all of these legal products into an indoor space, that we started to create the most astonishing effects and synergistic effects. And we, and we went in and asked where the products came from, where they were going. And the, the story was horrifying. And we were shunted uh, around left and right. There were very few people in the country dealing with this. And we did this first of the so-called green offices. And we've been doing it ever since. Now, in 1987, I was asked by the Jewish community in New York to design a proposal for a memorial of the Holocaust at Auschwitz. Uh, the Pope would not get involved in a convent that was there, and the Jews felt they should be able to pray there too, and I was the person asked to design the place to pray. And so I went to Auschwitz, and I stood in the center of the Birkenau camp, which is one mile in diameter, three miles in circumference of barbed wire, and I realized that designers had come together to signal the worst of human intention. And I thought about the idea that architects and engineers were here designing a gate that said, and the work will set you free. And the engineers had laid out tracks that would bring people in on railroad cars, and they'd come out of cattle cars, and they'd be taken into gas chambers, where they'd be exposed to Cyclone B from E. Gay Farben Chemical Works nearby, where they would be killed. And then their teeth and their hair, sometimes their skin, would be removed. And then the bodies would be taken to crematoria, where they were stacked, and engineers were calculating how to most efficiently stack the human corpse for efficient combustion. If you were taken out on the other side of the cattle car, you were put in slave labor camps, and you were used by Ige Farben for slave labor and for chemical testing in human eyes. The cosmetics that the people in this room are wearing today were tested in human eyes at Birkenau. And you realize that if design is a signal of tension, this was the design of a giant killing machine. And a designer at some point has to say, wait a minute, I don't involve myself in this. 
I can't participate in this project. When did the architects and engineers of this place say, I can't do this work? And then you realize, not only can you say, I can't do this work, you have to say, wait a second, I have to stop this thing. And then you say, no, no, I have to, I have to go against this fiercely. I have to become a revolutionary. And I got back to New York, and I looked at the specifications for the Paul Stewart Men's Store we were designing on Madison Avenue, and I realized that without my ability to change it, I was designing a gas chamber. And there was nothing I could do. The glues, the materials, off-gassing, carpets. And I realized that if I had to design gas chambers, it was time to become a revolutionary, because this is something that I didn't want to participate in. Because let me give you the retroactive design assignment of the first industrial revolution. And while I give it to you, I'd like you to think about Birkenau, and I'd like to think about your intentions. And here's your assignment. I want you to get up every morning and actively engage and support an industrial system that treats nature as its enemy, measures productivity by how few people are working, Progress by your number of smokestacks, if you're especially proud, put your names on them. Prosperity by how much of your natural capital you can cut down, dig up, bury, burn, or otherwise destroy. Requires thousands of complex regulations to keep you from killing each other too quickly. Destroys cultural and biological diversity at every turn, seeking one-size-fits-all solutions. And while you're at it, produce a few things so highly toxic, they'll require thousands of generations to maintain constant vigilance while living in terror. Can you do this for me? Is this fun? At this point in human history, it seems to me that we could, we could understand that it's time to recognize the concepts of, of negligence and to develop strategies of change before these strategies of tragedy um, become, um, become um, impossible to subvert. And so we've developed some new strategies. And in 1990, I'm sorry, 1991, I was asked, Josh, we're going to start them up now. Josh, we're going to get going. Uh, in 1991, uh, the city of Hanover, Germany, won the bid for the World's Fair, which is going on right now in Hanover, and uh, asked me if I would prepare the principles for the fair. They were looking for someone who could examine the best of human intention. And if you think about this culture, the Germans, they had gone to that dark place in 1940, like an addict or an alcoholic, before they 12-stepped their way out. They went to a very dark place, and this culture was there. And they, they were, here they were, 60 years later, saying, what would the best of human intention be, and how would it reflect itself in the design of a World's Fair? So we did the principles, and they're here. I'll go through them quickly. Insist on the rights of humanity and nature to coexist. This doesn't say, please hope that they will. This says, you must become active. Recognize interdependence. Uh, e expand design considerations to even distant effects. Respect relationships between spirit and matter. Now, the Germans tried to get this one eliminated. They said it was too fuzzy. We said we went to the indigenous peoples. They said this is the only principle. They all come from here. So we're leaving it. It was number eight. We said we'd like to make it number five. They said, no, we're getting rid of it. I said, no, let's make it number three. Do you see where we're going? And they said, fine, it's number three. Now, why does this matter? I was on the phone with the, uh, the CEO of Monsanto. And, and I'm calling for an, a conference on the ethics of genetic engineering. And, and it was, why does the spirit-matter connection matter to this, for example? And I said, think of it from a business perspective. If you cross BT, a bacteria, with soybeans and corn, a plant, you've crossed the animal kingdom with the plant kingdom, something God hasn't tried to do. And then at what point are Hindus unable to eat American food? When can you no longer be a vegetarian? That's interesting. Six weeks later, after this conversation, they started burning Monsanto crops in India. Look at the Human Genome Project. They've put human genome into swine to create medical sera. That's interesting. What happens to the pigs? You might have had it for breakfast. At what point do we become cannibal? Did you want human genome with your eggs? Perhaps we should be asked if that's something we really want to do. Accept responsibility for the consequences of design, the Bill of Responsibilities. Create safe objects of long-term value. Don't burden future generations. Design for reversibility. What if we're wrong? Eliminate the concept of waste. This has taken on uh, legs of its own. I think this is one of the most important of the principles that, that has attracted so much interest. Because this is not saying minimize waste. This is not eco-efficiency. This, e e this is a whole other strategy. Rely on natural energy flows, like nature. Understand the limitations of design, be humble, and seek constant improvement by the sharing of knowledge. Let me show you some projects. 
and, some, and our systems that we use to work with. I have two companies, McDonough Browngart Design Chemistry with Michael Browngart, and we have developed some principles that we use. Waste equals food, use current solar income, and respect diversity. Now think of it this way. I'll talk about waste equals food a little bit more, but respect diversity and use current income. Think of it this way. As a poet, Einstein is a poet. You've got energy, which is physics, and you've got mass, which is chemistry, and you put the two together at at c squared, which is the speed of light, and all of a sudden you have this single magical moment that scientists have yet to explain, which is the magic of life itself, the single photosynthetic cell, which then turns itself into us, sentient beings with spiritual consciousness, imagine. And then you realize that that creates a fecund situation where the planetary surface has all heaven break loose, and it's more and more niches, and it's more and more species, and it's more and more energy gets transform, of, transforms chemistry into biology, and growth is good. Isn't that amazing? And all of a sudden, you realize the debate today between commerce and the environmentalists is, is growth, no growth. The environmentalists say growth is destroying the world. The industry says growth is what we have to have to support commercial, our commercial engine. And that's not the discussion. The question is not whether we grow or we don't grow. It's like, how do we want to grow? What do we want to grow? Let's grow intelligence and not stupidity. Let's grow health and not sickness. Let's grow prosperity and not poverty. The question is, what do you want to grow? Ask a six-year-old, is growth good? So if we grow asphalt, then we have to see it as two words assigning blame. <laughs> Waste equals food, I think, is the fundamental principle that we'll look at today. But before, I'll show you the criteria we use. We use three uh, basic criteria that everybody uses, cost, performance, aesthetics. At architecture school, I'm sure you're aware we changed that to aesthetics, performance, and cost. But it's still the same three principles. Uh, to that, we've added, is it ecologically intelligent, is it uh, just, and is it fun? I was with Michael Dell the other day because Dell Computers is adopting our protocol for their machines. And I was sitting with Michael Dell and he says, you know, you and Jefferson are interesting guys, but there's, you got a problem, you know. Isn't it interesting? Ecological intelligence is life, justice is, is liberty, and fun is the pursuit of happiness. But you forgot the most important thing. So what's that? Bandwidth. <laughs> What we're saying is if waste equals food, then everything is a nutrient. If it's a nutrient, it belongs in either a biological cycle of metabolism or technical metabolism and shouldn't go anywhere else. The biological metabolism we call products of consumption, the technical metabolism we call products of service. Things of consumption should be designed to go back to the soil safely. Things of industry should be back, designed to go back to industry safely and no poisoning. And this is not eco-efficiency in all honor to all the eco-efficiency people and the energy gurus and everything else. Efficiency has run a dead end, I think, because if you look at it as a design perspective, it says you wake up in the morning feeling 100% bad, you try and spend your day feeling better by being less bad, and your goal is zero. Is this fun? You run out of steam. Because this is like saying, if I could leave here and go north to Canada or south to Mexico, if I found myself going 100 miles an hour towards Canada when I was supposed to be going to Mexico, it's not going to help me to slow down to 20. I'm going the wrong way. So we're calling for something we call eco-effectiveness, where we say that eco-efficiency is a Zeno's paradox of reducto ad absurdum, and that once you've lost your, you've reduced it by 10, uh, uh, 90 percent, you have a new 100 percent, and so on and so on and so on. So eco-effectiveness, which is a strategy we outlined in Atlantic Monthly in October 98 in an article called The Next Industrial Revolution, says, let's imagine we're only 10% sustaining. And notice I'm not saying sustainable. When I won this word at the White House, the press came up and said, oh, Mr. Sustainable. I felt like Mr. Natural. You know? And they said, tell me, Mr. Sustainable, what does it all mean? I said, well, I'm really not that interested in sustainability, because if it's the edge between destruction and regeneration, if it's a kind of maintenance program, how exciting is that? You know, are you married? I said, what's your relationship to your wife? And you said, sustainable. <laughs> I would say, I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> it's not that interesting, maintenance. Oh, let's go maintain. <laughs> so we're looking for a fecundity here. We're looking for an excitement. And so let's imagine what a 100% good world looks like and then move towards that with vigor. So it's not, let's be less bad, let's just be different. And so the, the, the strategy starts to change. So instead of having all this stuff over time that we're using up, and then we project these tragedies, and go, oh, we're going to run out of stuff. And then eco-efficiency says, oh, use less stuff over time. Well, this says the Mitsubishi use twice as many, make twice as many cardboard boxes out of the trees in Indonesia. Does it change the story? Gregory Bateson, when he wrote Mind and Nature at the same time, he was coining the term cybernetics with Norbert Wiener here at MIT, has an amazing moment in this book, which is late 60s. This is back when Hal was singing Daisy Daisy in 2001. This is long before the web. 
And he asked the computer, he said, tell me, computer, when do you think computers will begin to think like humans? And the computer pauses and goes, hmm, that reminds me of a story. <laughs> we communicate with stories. What is our story? So let's change time into stuff. Let's change stuff into intelligence, because if we need a y-axis, why not we get smarter and smarter? And as time goes on, we're getting smarter and smarter, and we're using less and less stuff, because we're sequestering it into technical or biological cycles, and that allows us to leave the rest of the world alone. Now, if we look at this, we realize that we've been somewhere between socialism and capitalism and a social market economy, and that any ism is a dangerous thing, racism, fascism, next, uh, uh, sexism, and so on. A pure capitalist would destroy the environment, they cut the trees, forget the fish. A pure socialist will yield, as Alexei Yapikov tells us, a former USSR that is now 16% uninhabitable. This would be like putting a fence around Texas, which is perhaps what George Bush wants us to do. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> It's in honor of the evening. I mean, um, if we look at the other ism that's been missing, it's the ecological context, which we call ecologism. But the problem is, ecologism would be just as dangerous as any other ism. If I said, you must put you know, solar collectors on your building and solar electrify, you know, you tell, your wife gets terrified, your neighbors get nervous, the house looks terrible, you have to make investments in, in technology you don't understand, learn electrical engineering, negotiate with your local monopsony, put ugly heavy metal blade and blue rectangles on your roof, and, and uh, do something completely uneconomical. Go for it. So we realize that what we have to do is find this place where we can bring social need with capital need with ecological need together and find this sweet place where things join. And so we've developed tools that we're using with these clients of ours to help them understand it. It's a fractal tile, it's a Sierpinski gasket, that allows you to go around and in the economy corner, you have the economy, economy corner, you see? And the question is, can we make it and sell it at a profit, pure capitalism? And when we talk to these companies and say, this is your first question, uh, if you can't make it for a profit, don't do it. You're commerce, not guardian. They all go, The next question would be economy equity. What is the question? This is Nike's question. Are employees earning a living wage? The next question is equity economy. What's the question? Are women and men being paid the same for the same work? Equity first. The next would be equity equity. Nothing to do with ecology or economy. What's the question? Are people treating each other with respect? Sexism, racism, and so on. The next would be equity ecology. Is it fair to expose your workers to cancer in the workplace or to children to, to uh, phthalates in Barbie's head. Um, ecology equity, is it fair to destroy the world with global warming? Ecology ecology, just waste equal food. Uh, are you safe in natural technical cycles? Ecology economy, are you being productive with your use of resources? And then e e uh, economy equity, I mean e ecology, are we being efficient? This is eco-efficiency. And what we see is that most of the world's focused on the lower right triangle. There's pure capitalism, there's business for social responsibility, and then there's natural capitalism, eco-efficiency, and so on. And that we're saying we have to expand these considerations much more broadly. So let me show you some products. In 1993, we were asked by Steelcase Corporation to design a fabric. We said, waste equals food. They said, oh yes, we should use cotton, which is natural, and PET from soda bottles, which is recycled. You have recycled, you have natural. What do you think? Do you think we should make that? Can it go back to, safely to soil? Not with PET. Can it go back to industry forever? Not with the cotton. Cotton, is it ecologically intelligent? Say goodbye to the RLC. 23% of the world's pesticides relate to cotton. It has never been associated with social fairness. Polyethylene terephthalate is full of uh, UV stabilizers and antioxidants, plasticizers, and antimony residues from catalytic reactions, uh, toxic heavy metals. Do you want this next to your skin? Sorry, Patagonia. And so what we realized is that we could design a fabric that if we designed it so that, that we, we could go to a mill which had had declared its trimmings of its cloth in Switzerland were declared hazardous waste by the Swiss government. They couldn't sell it in Switzerland or bury or burn it in Switzerland anymore. They had to ship it to Spain. And you realize you've hit the wall of the first industrial revolution when your product uh, can be sold but your trimming is declared hazardous waste. And so we said, we went to 60 chemical companies and said the filters of the future will be in our heads, not on the ends of pipes. And how about no more cancer, no more birth defects, no more mutagenic effects or endocrine disruption? And 60 companies said, we're sorry. And then we went to Siba Geigy and the chairman let us in. And we looked at, at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industries with these intellectual filters. 
And with these intellectual filters, we had to eliminate 7,962. We were left with 38 chemicals. And we did the entire fabric line with only those 38 chemicals. Won three gold medals. Uh, it is now being adopted by the air airline industry as the product of choice for aircraft seating because you can eat this fabric safely. If you have a fiber deficiency, you can eat your chair. <laughs> And now the trimmings of these bolts of cloth are taken and made into felts and given to the local garden club where they're mulched for the local strawberries. Waste equals food, in this case, strawberries. But when the Swiss inspectors came to inspect the water coming out of this mill, they thought their equipment had broken because the water coming out was as clean as or cleaner than the water going in, which is Swiss drinking water. At which point you can turn the pipe around because you'd rather use effluent than influent, at which point there's nothing to regulate because there is no release. This product has no regulations. And the president of the company could tell the people in the factory it was time to take off their masks. They could take off their gloves. They weren't trying to kill them anymore. We've applied this to carpets as products of service. What you want is comfort underfoot. You can go back, Josh. You want comfort underfoot, not uh, or some appearance, probably not in this case. Um, you want acoustics and so on and so forth. And, and what you get is hazardous and toxic waste. And so we're designing these things so they can go back to the industry forever. So when you get the carpet, you get new carpet, new carpet, new carpet. We've done it the same with shower gels. We're now applying it to automobiles. We're working with Ford Motor Company. We're redoing the River Rouge, which I'll show you. And we're looking at cars require 50,000 pounds of raw material per car, and only about 1,000 pounds is actually recycled. And so we're developing protocols with Ford for cars that become cars that become cars that become cars. We're able to develop environmental statements with our, our clients that look at every molecule that's moved through their system. We show how we're performing based on the protocol. We show how the improvements can be constant so that the products can become sustaining. With buildings, we're designing buildings for Herman Miller, a building that won Business Week's Design for Business Award, the best bus building for business in America. Performance is up 24% with the same number of people. They're producing $30 million every three months more than they used to with the same 300 people. And, uh, and the building, uh, they say that we gave them the building as a present. It's fully daylit, uh, full of fresh air. The people wear Aloha shirts, sunglasses, listen to the Beach Boys, make furniture, and productivity is up. Go figure. Um, <laughs> It's a fully daylight building. We're now doing another one for them. For the Gap, we won a competition for the corporate campus. You can see the site in that corner there. It's the last green site in San Bruno. We decided that we would make a building where the birds would fly over and go, oh, it's our people. So the roof is an undulating meadow of the native grasses of San Bruno. The roof also is an undulating cloud over the people who work there, so it's full of daylight and fresh air. We use the nighttime air to flush the building and cool the mass of the building down using computer floors to use the building like a giant battery. We, uh, we just got an award from PG&E as the, one of the most energy efficient buildings in California, but it wasn't designed to be energy efficient. We didn't say minimize the sun and minimize the fresh air to 15 cubic feet per minute. We said optimize 100% fresh air, 100% uh, daylight for every individual in the building. It's effective, not efficient. And yet we were able to, to have it be one of the least uh, energy consuming buildings uh, ever. Uh, that's a roof. For Nike, we did the European campus where we won a competition set as the largest geothermal system in Holland. It's designed to take photovoltaics and grass roofs in the future. We put the running track over the front door. This is Nike. Just do it. Um, as a result, we got the commission for IBM's new Dutch headquarters, European headquarters. And here's a building we did for to David Orr at Oberlin College. We said, asked the designers this question. Here's your question. How many of you can think of the most high-tech building you can possibly imagine? And imagine this. You can go into a meadow and with your left hand scrape away the dirt or use a bulldozer if you want. And then put something that you've designed in the ground that starts to make oxygen, sequester carbon, fix nitrogen, distill water, accrue solar energy as fuel, make complex sugars and food, create habitat for thousands of species, change color with the seasons and self-replicate. And so we realized how sophisticated is human design. So we decided to explore the concepts of designing buildings like trees. And so we've designed a building here that does those things. This building makes more energy than it needs to operate. The students watch their sewage being treated in the lobby of the auditorium by plants and microbes and animals while they uh, wait for their lectures. The objectives were complicated. The team was huge. And we found ourselves with, with agendas that no one really had to think about typically and really forced ourselves to stretch the limits of the human imagination for the design of these buildings. But it was a great joy. And as John pointed out, we're now doing the same with Woods Hole Research Center, which is a building being made out of carbohydrate and silica for the University of Hawaii. We're doing a new Center for Sustainable Future, which we've just been told will become the place that the tr local tribe has chosen to be married. And we're doing a new town for the utility of northern Indiana, where we're modeling it on the ancient hydrology of the upper Mississippi. This is the waste treatment plant. 
uh, and the utility will lease the south-facing surfaces of the buildings so they can provide solar collection for the, for the families instead of them having to do it. And we have a, a daycare center, elder care center, and a botanical garden that does the laundry for the town so the elders and the children come back together again. And we're designing new transport systems with Intel, Palm, Ford, and so on. And the last project I'll show you is the River Rouge plant for Ford Motor Company. Uh, we're working on this with actually with Julie Bargman, who's here on the faculty at, at the graduate school. She's actually from our faculty at Virginia, but we, she's on loan to you short term. Um, and uh, the Rouge is an astonishing project. It was Henry Ford's first vertically integrated industrial facility. Coal and iron ore come in on the left, and cars come out on the right. The joke in Dearborn, Michigan, is that this is a color photograph. <laughs> this is Charles Sheeler's famous iconographic image of the Rouge. This, pro this, pro this is a color photograph. Um, this project is a $2 billion budget and will take us about 20 years. This is the inlet pipe from the Detroit River for process water. These are Diego Rivera's famous images from the Detroit Art Institute of the Rouge. And the first industrial revolution, people and machines. And the question will be, what does the future look like in the relationship of people and their machines? And so what we're positing is a seven generation plan for Ford Motor for the current chairman, William Clay Ford Jr., where we looked at the site 200 years ago, which is in the center. And then we looked at it when Henry Ford arrived. And then we looked at it today to see what was left of the natural world. And what we're positing, and I think will astonish you, be approved by the board tomorrow, we believe, um, that we'll be able to talk about this in about a month, is we're strategizing with the community so that the facility itself becomes part of the natural world once again and sets a model for the regeneration of the ecosystems of the Rouge River. And in this way, human beings, once again, find themselves in their rightful and natural place using that one thing that separates them from all other species, which is this inherent creativity and sense of intention and that we can evidence our intention to honor and celebrate the abundance of the world instead of bemoaning its limits, while we respect our relation to it in a way that understands the notion of kinship, and that we can honor and keep safe our children's 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 children from the intergenerational remote tyranny that is us and our bad design. Thank you. Well, now you know why you came. Uh, we have some time for questions. There are four uh, microphones set up, one on each side of the first floor and one uh, on each side of the second floor. So those with questions should line up at uh, one mic or another. Uh, I ask you uh, to uh, briefly say your name and affiliation and, uh, and then your question. We're hoping most of them will be questions and not speeches so that we'll have time for quite a number. The trouble is, the upper ones, which are right there, are hard to see. Over here on the right, please. Uh, Tim Anderson, Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT. Uh, where would you say the happiest people in the world are, and where are the most unhappy? All right here, right now. <laughs> um, that's it. I, I, I think. Uh, I, it'd be hard for me to answer that quickly. I mean, I, I, having lived in, in rural situations, I think that it's a really hard question because I, I've been in so many places where so many people have so little and yet they're so much happier than so many who have so much um, that I, I think that it's in the human nature to be uh, an optimist. So I, I don't know that I can answer that question. Sorry. Ah, yes, got it. Uh, uh, my name is Mike Jacobs. I work for the firm Second Wind in Somerville. And my question to the speaker is, when you work with clients, is your entree have to begin at the top of the organization? It helps. <laughs> We're often asked by people in companies if we could come, their CEO doesn't get it, or chairman, or uh, chairperson, could we come and work with them and help them get it? And typically we say, uh, probably not. Um, 
And we call this trying to teach mules how to play the violin. It sounds terrible, and the mules don't like it. <laughs> so we really go where we're wanted. Um, and typically, we do work with the top person. It really helps to have a lot of pull. Uh, and we insist on working with the top person. Over here on the left. Hi, my name's Jennifer, and whoa, I'm working for an energy efficiency firm here. Um, it's an engineering firm that's not necessarily my track. Um, I'm really interested in what you have to give for advice for people who are you know, just starting out and trying to figure out how to go as far as possible you know, in the vision that we see. Well, I think the main thing is to not accept the world the way it is. Easy. <laughs> and then just try and be less bad and get at it. I think just celebrate, celebrate your own intelligence and the possibilities. I also think it's really critical that environmentalists get away from guilt. This whole thing of feeling really guilty all the time um, isn't going to help us. We're just dust, and we're going to be here for a certain amount of time, do whatever we do. I'd rather do this than that. So, you know, can we change make a difference? I don't know. But it seems to me that this is the kind of work to do, and I, I think if you can just focus on making sure you, as Joseph Campbell would say, follow your bliss, um, you know, you might get as close to there as you can. I would just do that. But I think being less bad doesn't get me up in the morning. <laughs> Over here. Hi, I'm Laura Wilson. I work at the Kennedy School. I'm actually lucky enough to be John Holden's assistant. Um, so I have a definite interest in all this, the environmentally sound, ecological, sustainable development, everything. Um, I want to thank you also for your work in Detroit, because I'm actually from Detroit, and I'm going to be more happy to go back there now. I feel a little more safe, like I can breathe. Um, Not yet. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess in 20 years. <laughs> um, I still be, I plan on being around. Um, but that's great news. I wanted to ask you, when you're, when you're looking into the materials that you're making these buildings with and all the, the emissions of the, the, you know, the hazardous waste and the, the, you know, the gaseous releases and things, um, how, how can we, you know, you had a trouble at that initial place trying to get that information from the companies that saying it was prepared, proprietary. So how do we as consumers get that information, like we want to make informed decisions, vote with our pocketbook, so we want to go buy, buy a carpet or buy paint or whatever, you know, in terms of working with the architect in a house, we can't get you. How would we make informed decisions about making a green house, making our house green? Perhaps? There's quite a lot of information flying around about this. And there, the obvious source is something called Environmental Building News up in uh, Burlington, Vermont, which has a compendium and keeps building. Um, a lot of different people keeping different lists and so on. I think what we're going to see is that very quickly are the products are actually going to be coming into the marketplace based on these protocols. We're actually in negotiations right now for a whole range of products that, for the home and things like that that meet these protocols. So I think we'll see it in a few years. So I just do the best you can right now. Um, and and uh, I think you'll see that as time goes on that they'll, they'll get a lot better. The problem is that everybody's making claims. I mean, the carpet industry, every single company says pretty much the same thing, like we're wonderful, and they're not, you know. Um, so it's hard. it's hard to thrash through that. It's also hard, we heard today, somebody was saying, well, how can you work with Ford and Nike and Gap? You know, aren't these the worst demons on the planet? You know? and, um, and it is interesting that I work with a company that designed a car that can be seen from the moon. I mean, that is interesting. Um, <laughs> but what you realize is that if, if, the, if, the, uh, if we don't work with them, who, who's going to do it? And, and the, 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 the exciting thing is they're actually all very excited about doing these things. So I think what we'll see is quickly over time that you can support the companies that are making the changes. I think that's, that's as important as anything else because the products just aren't there yet because we haven't had any design principles. I mean, you know, when we designed that fabric, one of the things that came up was, you know, how many people out there are designing things and they're sitting there thinking, oh, there's one we shouldn't make. You know, what is the design? What is the, you know, what is the ethical platform on which they're operating? There is none, right? It's cheap. I can afford it. It works. Okay, sell it. You know, that's it. It's legal. And so I think what, what you're about to see are companies that are actually getting past that. So it's going to be a while before we see the products. So at this point, I couldn't even get a, a good safe no, carpet? No rebuttal. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we have too many people standing in line. Top right. Hi, my name is Ken Choi, a student here at the Kennedy School. How would you apply your ideas in um, developing nations, wouldn't it be a bit luxury to people living in Bangladesh, for example, who has to worry about how to feed their children, children and children, rather than worry about the economic, I mean, the um, environment systems? Right. Um, that's a really critical question. I think that, you know, all these questions will have to be determined at the local level. The thing that I think is interesting is if you play the strategy out, is everything, if everything is seen as valuable, 
See, that's the difference. We see carbon as an asset. We see packaging as an asset instead of as waste. If you imagine looking through a waste dump right now, what you've got are toxic materials that have nowhere to go but to cradle to grave life cycle. If, if packaging was all designed to become fertilizer, and safe, for example, and, and materials like shoes were designed, like the shoes we're talking about, the soles will abrade into natural material that makes the worms happy. The uppers are infinitely recyclable and are valuable to the company so that essentially everything has value. That means that all of the materials of, of these protocols become valuable at every single level. So if they're building healthy soil, then all of a sudden you find that this value starts to accrue. And so the, the real question is to get back to the issue of, of how to apply the principles broadly to allow the optimum democratic engagement with these things. If you go to ancient China, the understanding of waste equals food was profound. They developed medicine around the whole idea. They ate their bugs. And one of the reasons they ate their bugs, they didn't want to wait for the larvae to sprout wings and have their protein fly away. So you, you basically developed programs where the word shit in China was not a pejorative. Uh, and in fact, in the rural cultures, you often were, were impolite if you left after dinner without leaving a deposit because you were taking the nutrients. They truly understood the idea of the nutrient flows. And so I think if we're going to, to take these strategies and apply them, uh, one of the greatest places that benefits from them is the developing world, where all of a sudden everything starts to have value instead of everybody having to suffer from either a, a lack of access to healthy, safe materials, water, uh, soil and so on, and loss of nutrient flows, because the nutrient flow destruction is, go is the one that is completely endemic and is surely one of the most awkward of all the things humans have done. It takes 10,000 years to build an inch of soil, and, um, and at the rate we're losing it, um, this is something that, that really needs to be addressed as a design question. The uh, other side on the top, yes. Right. My name is Mary Ben, an architect in Cambridge. And my question is, how has your term at UVA being dean influenced your two businesses that you have? Huh. Well, when I finished being dean, we had very little work because uh, it's a state university. So I was working, I was being dean four days a week and working one day a week. So I was trying to do this one day a week, which you saw there, and it was tough. So I kept the firm small. Um, while I was dean, we kept the firm at around 20 people. I brought 14 people from New York when I became the dean. And uh, we kept it small so that I could pay attention to what I wanted to do. And then uh, since I've stopped being dean a year and a half ago, we now have about 100 people. Down here on the left. Hi, my name is Lester Hensley, and I'm a building products manufacturer. And uh, I'm interested to know what the if you can summarize the criteria that you have for products used in your structures, and particularly here as we sit in the neighborhood of WR Grace, whether you've uh, hit certain walls in certain product segments, particularly where perhaps waterproofing is involved and in areas where asphalt and PVCs and things like that have tended to uh, dominate products. Well, basically, we're looking for either biological or technical nutrient or both. Right now, we're working with tires, which is probably obvious, um, and looking at those polymers. Um, I think the main thing we look at is, uh, do the, does the material have a passport? Does it have a right to, to, to be here? Do we know where it came from? Do we know where we want to go with it? And so there are a whole bunch of, of transitional strategies. And I, one of the interesting things about roofing is that I think roofing will actually be one of those places we park a lot of the stuff that we've got out there while we figure out what to do with it. See, the problem with PVC, which is chlorine, which is dioxins, as you know, which is an endangered plastic species in our book, um, really, you know, we, we have to figure out what to do with it. And, and instead of, if we burn it, forget it, you've got dioxins. And if you landfill it, you've lost a very valuable, um, a very valuable material from a energetic perspective and, and from a polymerization perspective. But we can't quite figure out what to do with it yet for it cost effectively. So that might be a product that we actually want to look at in certain applications um, where, where we can work with it as a transitional material. But as we optimize, we basically look for biological or technical nutrients that don't contaminate either system. That's the basic flow. And everything else gets identified as something that needs to be re-optimized and designed out. It was funny when Nike made a statement that they wanted to get out of the chlorine business, they said, they said Nike's going to be PVC free. And we were amazed when they said it. I mean, obviously, we love that. But we never would have asked them to say it, because it's a very hard thing to do. And it's hard to convince people to say it. But they did it on their own. And, and then all of a sudden, the chlorine industry attacked. 
And it was the most astonishing thing. Uh, it was the chlorophylls, we call them. Um, and the, chlor the final institute um, sent a letter to the project manager at Nike, to the Nike to legal department. It got to the project manager who said this thing. Let's just, we're getting rid of PVC. But she sent it to us and he called them and said, boy, this is really amazing. You know, it says here, you will appear in Brussels on date certain, it was June 6th, at 8 o'clock in the morning to present your scientific case for why Nike is removing PVC from its products and da 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 you know, and all this stuff, all this lawyer language. And she called them and said, oh, you guys got to give me all the science and I got to get our lawyers involved. We got to get over there and we got to be there on June 6th or whatever it was. And Michael and I were listening to this and we both started laughing. And we said, listen, here's what you do. You call them back and you say four things. The first is, listen. We don't make orange shoes. There's a reason. The market doesn't want orange shoes. And we don't have the Orange Anti-Defamation League beating down our door saying, you must make orange shoes. We also don't make shoes out of lead. Most athletes find they're a little too heavy. And we don't have the lead industry saying, you must make shoes out of lead. So the third thing you need to know is, you've got a science problem. We have a marketing problem. We're doing this because we just don't want to market this. So you figure out your science. And by the way, the fourth thing is, we're going to ask our attorneys to send you a letter claiming that if you persist in asking us to show up, we're going to go after you for stupid product harassment. <laughs> I said, imagine if I came to you and said, you must hire me as your architect or I'll sue you. You know? Over here on the right. Hello. My name's Ambrose Spencer. I do some teaching and consulting and a little research. I want to ask a question about master planning as it applies to sustainable building. <clears throat> There's a disagreement about carbon. I choose to take the Greenpeace carbon logic position, which shows that we need to get to a zero emissions by the middle of this century. There's also disagreement about what structural reforms to the law are required. Some say business as usual, some say that we need the uh, ecological economics reforms of pricing, discounting, ownership, charters, and equity. Uh, some people say even that won't be enough, that we need systemic replacement of the legal system to do a kind of Hammurabi or a, Mo a Moses kind of thing in order to get us to sustainability. My question to you is, when you, since when you design a building, you need to design the building complete. In other words, you need to look down the road that this building can be made sustainable. Since in our present, our present pricing and legal and design situation, we can't do it all when the building gets, will, the building will be improved and then improved again and maybe we can get to zero. But that requires being able to look at the building over time from the time we build it through its first construction phase to its improvement and so on. Where in the world today is the best work going on for master planning for a sustainable building? You mean the build, master planning the buildings themselves or master planning communities around the issues? Master planning for buildings themselves. Okay. You're looking at the building through time and yeah. doing what you I can think, and must today yeah. and not doing what not makes it. sense later right. or what doesn't matter whether you do it now or later. Right. I think the most interesting things that we're seeing, if you look at the European laws, for example, in the case of, say, office buildings or institutional buildings, you're not allowed to be more than, in Holland, I think it's 5.5, uh, in Germany it's 8.5 meters from an operable window. What that means is those buildings that they design as office buildings are all designed to become housing in the future because they all are, are function based on natural energy flows and human proportions. So the buildings themselves can adapt over time. When you go to Rome and realize that the, the buildings there are centuries old, the Germans look at us and say, oh, a 20-year roof? And we go, yeah, 20 years, that's it. Isn't that exciting? That's our 20-year roof. They look and go, what are you guys talking about? We do 350-year roofs, 500-year roofs. It's very interesting. So they have a different time frame. Um, so I think that a lot of the strategies there, they look at it in that different time frame. We're starting to see that. That, that I think, is a, a, a critical idea. But the other thing is this idea of designing for that kind of flexibility, I think, is the key thing. And, and to stop thinking that the, the hegemony of the idea of the moment um, uh, controls. And so I think what we'll see is people start to design for reversibility. What if we made a mistake? 
And we've even seen this in some of our clients that they're designing an office building and then the market changes and all of a sudden their market, their office building doesn't make sense, but they can change the design midstream into an apartment building because we've designed it for safe proportions and all of a sudden they're in that market and, and that flexibility is hugely valuable to them. If you look at embodied energy questions in these buildings, um, at, at, once you start designing a building at 100 years, the embodied energy over time becomes almost an irrelevant equation and you can use really nice materials. And when you look at the carbon, the problem I think with carbon is everybody sees carbon as a liability. We see everything as an asset. We probably have rose-colored glasses, but I look at carbon as an asset. I don't look at it as a liability. I just don't understand why we're throwing it away 600 feet up in the air where it double glazes the planet when we could actually be sequestering it through new systems that actually take the carbon, bring them into fecund systems, and, and put the carbon into giant carbon engines for the future. So I think there's a whole other way of looking at it. In fact, I'd rather love carbon than hate carbon. Right. We uh, are running out of our lease. I'm going to take one more question with apologies to the other people and in the rotation. The last one is uh, upper right. Hi, my name is Bill Hostman. Uh, just a quick question. It seems that uh, most of the um, uh, development that you're speaking of uh, sort of keeps uh, a business-as-usual approach to commerce and industry. But I'm just curious, do you see a role for a change in the attitudes of, uh, say, with regard to consumerism in the population or more social change? Um, uh, do you see a role for any of that in, in uh, sort of effective uh, eco oh, ecological effect. Absolutely, but I think, I think that that's obviously clear. I'm just showing you a snapshot of some <laughs> surface of this, but um, there's a huge change. But you see, that, again, the difference is this. There's a whole anti-consumer movement going on, and there's a, a voluntary simplicity movement going on. And I think these things are wonderful. If, if, that, if you enjoy that kind of thing, it's great. Um, but at the, on the other hand, you know, I think there's a quirky kind of wonderful opportunity here to celebrate abundance. And I, don't, I think that's what's been missing. Because you know, I think that if you want to use all the hot water in the world, go ahead. You know, waste it like crazy. If you want to use all the energy in the world, go ahead. Use it. Waste it like crazy, it's fine. As long as it's solar powered, I don't care. Right? If you want to take a solar shower, make it as long as you want. If you're going to purify the water, use as much as you feel like. You know? That's the difference. So we celebrate this abundance. You see, efficiency, I think, is a demeaning agenda in the end. So this voluntary simplicity and, and anti-consumption really needs to be tempered by the idea of, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could consume things because they were wonderful and they were fun? You don't look in the world of efficiency and find anything of human delight. You don't look at a cherry tree in the spring and say, oh my god, how many blossoms does it take? You know? <laughs> I mean, imagine an, uh, imagine an efficient Italian dinner, you know, a little red capsule and a glass of water. Oh, yum. Right? Efficient Mozart. Hit the piano with a two-by-four. Got him. All at once. You know? I mean, efficiency is not interesting. And so, so I think I'd rather celebrate the abundance of great things than keep bemoaning our limits on the bad things. Well, again, I apologize to those who, who uh, would have wanted to ask additional questions. I do want to thank you again, Bill. You even made contact with the members of my ENR 100 class in the room who learned on Tuesday how to calculate that it does indeed take 10,000 years to make an inch of soil. Uh, thank you for a spectacular presentation. <laughs>